Hi, everybody. We're back. This is Dave Vellante live from Santa Clara, California. We're at Strata, the Strata Conference, the O'Reilly Media, big event, big data event, making data work. Uh, this is day two for us. It's, uh, it's day two for the conference. Yesterday was a lot of you know, deep dives, a lot of practitioners. Today really kicked off the, uh, the morning sessions, the big tent, the keynotes. Uh, we've had a number of those, those morning speakers on here. Uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Jeff Kelly, who's Wikibon's lead big data analyst. Uh, this is SiliconANGLE's continuous coverage, The Cube where we bring you all the smartest people, the knowledge, the technology people, the practitioners, the bloggers, the opinion makers, and we're here with Mike Hoskins, who's the CTO of Pervasive Software. Uh, Mike, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you very much, Dave. Pervasive, making Hadoop faster and easier. Two things that we need. <laughs> right, that's what you guys are all about, is that right? Yeah, in, in a nutshell, actually, you've captured it very well. We just uh, announced uh, our first product from the fledgling pervasive big data startup division that we have inside pervasive software. It's called Rush Analyzer, and we're showing it inside in the booth, and it's exactly about uh, making big data processing, in this case, uh, predictive analytics and data mining, uh, faster and easier. You nailed it. Yeah, so, um, so why is uh, Hadoop slow and hard? Well, it's not slow and hard, <laughs> I, I think the the right way would, you, would you characterize it as fast and easy? Uh, <laughs> no, but I think it's safer. I'm just going to extremes. To, to be fair, I think immature is, okay. is maybe My a, words, a folks, good, uh, not Mike's. <laughs> slow and hard, no, we love Hadoop. A good designation. Yeah. So at, at Pervasive, uh, so I'm CTO at Pervasive. We're, we're a public company. We do about 50 million a year in sales. Uh, been around a long time, headquarters in Austin, Texas. Uh, we've started, uh, doing something that we call the Pervasive Innovation Dividend. We invest uh, some of our money in startups that were organically growing inside Pervasive. Uh, we've got one around cloud computing called the Pervasive Data Cloud. And then uh, I just took over a new division that we created uh, from scratch inside Pervasive, only 15 people, uh, called Pervasive Big Data. And it's kind of a merger of our uh, Data Rush product, which is our next generation, massively parallel, scalable, fine-grained, thread-level uh, processing engine and Hadoop, and, and for several years now we've been investing heavily in Data Rush and, and that parallel processing technology. But uh, for three years I've been running something called the Innovation Lab inside Pervasive, where I get to experiment with any technology I want. And I picked Hadoop early, three years ago, as uh, something that to keep my eyes on. And the more I got into it, the more I was really, really impressed with it. And so uh, I think it is fair to say it's immature. Uh, yeah. I think we're in a highly disruptive period, actually, a fascinating period for those of us who are into data and data management as we're kind of bridging from the old to something new. We don't know what it's going to be yet, but, but uh, yeah, I Hadoop's mean, going to be a big part of it. I mean, a lot of what I'm saying is tongue-in-cheek, right? I mean, we were just not that long ago in the what is Hadoop mode, yes. right? And now we're really solving, beginning to solve some pretty serious business problems. Obviously, the internet giants are using it, and, uh, and we're seeing at conferences like this, enterprises everywhere. We had Nokia on before uh, earlier today. We've had them on er uh, Many, many other customers, and um, so it's real. Um, so talk about uh, your business model uh, with Data Rush. So it's actually it's quite interesting here. You talk about pervasive. You are um, you know it's a big theme in our community about how you know the big whales just don't innovate anymore. They buy companies to innovate. Right. Um, you guys at well under a hundred million, you know, are still very innovative, and yet you feel the the it's necessary to have these little skunk works going on to really stay ahead of the curve. So that's quite an interesting model. Um, what's your model with Data Rush and, and Big Data? Is there parts of it open source or, you know, do um, uh, you have a community edition? I mean, what, what's, how do you go to market with this thing? Uh, so some of this is being formulated as uh, we speak on the fly. I mean, we're, again, only five months old and thank you for recognizing the, the uh, attempt at innovation. We're a 30-year-old company and it's hard sometimes. So we did do the Skunk Works model. We literally put people away and said, you got to use new technologies, new IDs, and new tools. Right. And so Data Rush kind of sprung out of that. It, it's a, a, a platform, I mean, we saw the multi-core revolution very early, earlier than almost everybody, and so uh, Data Rush fully exploits all the cores in your servers, and it, it does very fine-grained thread-level programming. So using a data flow technology, it, it can process huge volumes of data at extreme low latencies of just a CPU and memory speeds. We don't do coarse-grained parallelism, we're not doing inter-process communication, we're not spilling the data onto the disk and off the disk, and so there's a lot of inherent advantages in Data Rush. So we think that's our secret sauce, we've got it. We We've used it for several years to build data quality tools. For example, we ship some, some data profiling and data matching tools. But the big idea here is to blend Data Rush into the Hadoop infrastructure and try and bring some value there. 
Uh, so first a little bit about the technology, then I'll come back to your business model. Yeah, let's stay on the technology for a bit, because okay. I got some follow up, and then we'll, we'll come back to the business right. model. This is really interesting, and it's your sweet spot, so you yeah. know, our audience loves this stuff. Okay, uh, so we think we have the secret sauce in, in Data Rush. It gives us some, some really game-changing price performance advantages. I mean, you bought the hardware, you ought to use it. You, you server, mm -hmm. Utilization rates are shockingly low in the industry in general. If you're getting 15, 20% utilization, you right. pat yourself on the back. Maybe we have virtualization that chops up an intelligent machine as several you know, less intelligent machines so that we can get some higher utilization you're on like the server. Like 25, 30. It's exactly, yeah. but it's still, I mean, it's tragically low. And, and so the idea here, if you're going to crunch big data and you bought the hardware, you might as well use it. And so the big idea behind DataRush is fully exploiting the, the, this magnificent multi-core gift that we've been giving and fully, in a scale-up kind of way, fully wringing every ounce of performance out of that server. And of course then, with Hadoop, you can then spread that goodness across n number of nodes in your cluster. But I think it behooves all of us to, to worry about efficiency. And I think we're going to see a lot of investing in, in you just heard Eric talk about next-gen MapReduce and the, all, the, the opportunity for alternative computational engines to drop into the API. MapReduce becomes an API, not a single go-to pattern and model. And DataRush, in fact, as a, as a data flow engine and a programming paradigm, is an ideal candidate. And, and we're actively working with Hortonworks to try and fit that hand in glove and get DataRush as another uh, alternative computational model and engine to live in, inside Hadoop. So we're very excited about the opportunity for, for Data Rush and our secret sauce to give us continued uh, scaling advantages and game changing price performance advantages. We're excited about what you're saying. Um, we've been covering in the Wikibon community, our, our CTO David Floyer has written a number of pieces on the whole changing IO infrastructure, IO architecture, and, and particularly you got so much data coming out of these cores now. and the, the notion of having flash on the other side of the channel to be able to capture some of that and, and write to a persistent resource changes the way in which applications companies are really looking at uh, developing applications and then the, the functionality and the value that's coming out of that is, is, a, is enormous. Does flash play into this? Uh, it's not relevant to us. I mean, if for a customer to adopt that, they do that for their own workload. Yep. And workloads that are a little more I.O. intense, a little more random I.O., I think are, are able to really exploit Flash. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, for a lot of sequential processing, and an enormous amount of what goes on in Hadoop is large batch style sequential processing. Yep. If you can, you know, HDFS is pretty amazing. We've got tests in our labs where we're getting two to three gigabytes a second out of commodity on a single node out of commodity spinning disk. And of course you get enormous terabytes at, at very reasonable dollars. So I think for, and this is what's one of the interesting things that's happening I think with the advent of Hadoop and a lot of what you see out here. You know, it used to be one database, uh, one hammer, everything's a nail, and whether you had OLTP or analytic workloads, you used the same database. And God I, box. I, yeah, that's right, and, and, and analytic workloads are actually different than OLTP transactional workloads. And that's where we have focused a lot. And so we're really focusing on streaming large data acquisition kind of applications, you start with terabytes coming in, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions and tens of billions of rows streaming in from the left, uh, going into something like HBase, for example, we're big fans of, of that column store that's inside Hadoop. Uh, so I think analytic workloads uh, at scale, being able to exploit the distributed file system, uh, the locality of the disk near the compute, uh, really an interesting columnar uh, and, and parallel and resilient and temporal uh, databases like HBase, that's the exciting thing to us in the Hadoop ecosystem. So how about, I mean, two questions, where do you play in the open source, what's your, you know, where do you fit and in, in tuck in, and, and how do you make money at this? No, it's, that's actually a good question, a vexing question for uh, many people in the industry. I can tell you what we're doing. Uh, we toyed originally with thinking about open source. We're not. We're, we're a closed source uh, stack. And we toyed a little bit with uh, a community edition. I think we're not going to go that way. I'll talk a bit about the product, and I think it helps understand maybe the go-to-market then for, for how we might uh, uh, make that a business. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we, we have this, the, the Data Rush engine. We wanted to offer that to the marketplace. Of course, we can sell it as a raw SDK, but people like to consume things uh, at a higher order of tooling. You know, we're familiar with SQL tools. It's a little bit like... Uh, you know, the, the SQL database wars in the late 70s and early 80s, I was there, I remember. You know, it was wild, it was the Wild West kind of like it is now. There yeah. was no obvious winner, there is now when we look back, but there wasn't it's then. so true, right? It, I mean, it, I was there too, and it's, you, you couldn't have predicted what happened, no, no way. There were debates over yeah. which SQL dialect, and there were, you know, people were even debating whether SQL was the right standard, and now 30 years later, you know, it's cast in stone. But, but it took 30 years to get there. In those early days, like Hadoop, it was very mature, there was no tooling, there were no loaders and unloaders and reorgs, and the BI thing hadn't happened, and so I, I kind of see that as the opportunity now. And so what we're taking, 
uh, is the goodness of Hadoop and its scalability, the goodness of Data Rush to be able to get even more game-changing price performance out of that, and build a layer of tooling that is familiar to us in the sense that we can use traditional SQL clients, but is radically more scalable and high performing. And what we're doing is taking uh, a tool that we find, typically an open source tool that we think is really good. We found a great data mining tool, for example. Has a beautiful UI, great plug and play framework. Doesn't scale that well for really big data. Most things don't scale that well for really big data. Mm -hmm. So we kind of extracted their runtime, dropped our high performing runtime engine it, added our native bindings to Hadoop, HDFS, and HBase, and so now we're showing in our booth over here a completely big data scalable end-to-end -end pipeline for extracting and collecting and doing prepares and pre-computes and deep data mining, machine learning, and predictive analytics on data at scale living inside or outside Hadoop. A uh, product like that, which we call Rush Analyzer, uh, we're going to go to market with by making it free to developers. So I think the game in software has changed. I've been in it a long time. I know that. Uh, and, and one of the ideas that I like is that developers are your friend. Uh, we eventually expect some kind of monetization off of people who go into production, but while they're kicking the tires and evaluating, and we'd like to be as friendly as possible. So we will be a completely free model for developers so they can download uh, our Data Rush raw SDK and platform, and they can begin to get some of this performance if they want, or they can adopt the higher order tooling. So far we've just done Rush Analyzer, but we're looking at you know, extremely advanced scalable business intelligence, uh, monitoring applications, and all of them will be available free for developers. And so we hope to get some adoption with that model and then find a production sharing license where we can embed our technology. So, okay, so just to summarize, so it's, it's put it out there, make it free for developers, and, and then you know, make it sticky, hopefully, and then sort of figure out downstream how you're going to monetize it. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, they have to like it. You can't yeah. force it on them. And, so we want to make it easy to adopt and experiment and hopefully proliferate. And you're, you're, you're betting that if they like it and it, it proliferates, you'll be able to make money at it. Exactly. Yeah, that's, 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 I buy it. It's, uh, that's, that's good philosophy. <laughs> it works. Good. Um, Jeff, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, use cases. What, do, what kind of use cases do you think uh, are really going to, this is really going to support? What kind of new businesses, business models could it support? Um, really, you know, take it from the technology to, okay, here's yeah. what it's going to do for my organization. So that's a, a deep question, and I'll, I'll go sort of short term uh, first, and then I think what the real long term implications are, because I think they're impactful in a way that not everybody appreciates. Uh, so you, you often hear the phrase big data, big data, and it's sort of a testosterone test, how big is your data? And, and that's sort of cool, but you're increasingly seeing big data analytics stitched together. And I think you know, data science and data analytics are in some ways the real promise here. We've had it for quite a while, but with the volumes of data from the different uh, disciplines and domains that we're now collecting, I think we can do uh, predictive analytics in a way that we haven't done before. So why are people excited? because they can predict the future. I think we, we, we sometimes throw around the words data science and predictive analytics, but what does it mean? It means that in a way that we've never been able to before, we will attempt to and get better and better with each succeeding generation at predicting the future. That's what predictive modeling is. It's, it's passing through mountains and mountains of data to establish a model of behavior that you can use to predict the future. Not any different than the FICO score that we all have to predict whether we're deadbeats or not, whether we're going to pay our mortgage or not. And I think that is the big idea here. Why is it society changing? Uh, and, and so the investment everybody's making is, yeah, there's big data and there's undiscovered patterns and we can begin to discover the real models and we can predict it. What's really going on here is a societal shift from uh, human-based decisioning to machine-based decisioning. I don't know if you saw the movie Moneyball. Uh, mm -hmm. Apart from being a great book and a great movie, it's really uh, a, a great illustration of the shift from a system where, how do we make decisions? Well, you know, we scratched our chin, a, a wizened, grizzly veteran looked at something and said, yeah, I think that's a baseball player, you know? And, and, and <laughs> human intuition drives an enormous amount of decision-making that's going on out there. Even the, the most advanced domains, lawyering and doctoring, are still dominated by human intuition to a large degree. Nothing wrong with having that in the game, but what if we could augment that with predictive models? What if the gathering of data allowed us to build better and better predictors? Why did Netflix pay a million dollars to improve their recommender system by 10%? Because it really makes a difference. And so businesses of, of all sizes will want to predict their own future. And I think that's the big idea here. And, and if I can close the loop here, if you're building these predictive models, you can tie them back into the real-time decisioning systems eventually. Right. And so the, the big dream here 
is that we can get better and better at building our models and then applying those models into our day-to-day -day decisioning systems, which are mixed man and machine, and increasingly have machines help us, augment us, make better and better decisions. Right, the challenge with, with predictive models in the past has always been that you know, the assumptions uh, you know, really dictate the quality of the, the outcomes. And, and you know, many predictive modeling initiatives of the past didn't live up to the, the hype and the promise. Um, because you know the assumptions maybe weren't all that what they were cracked up to be, so now it's uh, the the a function of the data. Right? Right. So we're not doing a top down approach anymore. Um, we're you know doing a bottoms up, no sampling, I, take I, the entire data set. I, I could not agree. You, you made a point that that is that is the religion inside pervasive big data. Mm. Uh, there have been enormous compromises made in data science over the past. And we make compromises, we sample the data, because if you ran all the data, the job would run for six hours. Well, that just means you have bad hardware and software. But because it's bad hardware and software, we have to compromise and shrink the data, miss black swans, don't make better predictions. We have to make compromises around the science. We can't use the best algorithms. We have to use fuzzy approximation algorithms. Because if we use the true science, we're doing some work with the University of Texas around genetic pipelines and analytics. And, and the best sort of genome sequencing algorithm isn't used because it would run for 20 hours, and so they use an approximation that isn't as good. And so compromises have crept into our science simply because we can't process all the data. As the data volumes grow, it's a more demanding problem. And so the, the investment we're making is so that you can actually scale at a reasonable price point for all the data and your best science. And I think as Google has proven, more data and more data makes better decisions. In fact, they famously said data uh, trumps, you know, bigger data trumps better algorithms. I think the right answer is both. No compromises on the data side, no compromises on the science side, and I think we'll see predictive modeling come back from the black eye that it had, in, as you point out. And you can actually simplify the algorithms if you have a lot of data, and, and, and normal people can actually conceive of things that you could do to the data that could have valuable outcomes. And I think the difference is, this time around, is even though we might, might, might not get it right the first time, you can iterate very quickly because the data stack has been commoditized and technology is not the gate anymore. Do you, do you agree with that? Oh, I, I, that, that word iterate is, is very important to us. The essence of science is experimentation and iteration. And we talk to scientists regularly who, who are frustrated because the, you know in a two hour or three hour runtime they just can't really do their science. They have to make compromises <laughs> and they, they'd rather iterate time, and iterate yeah. and iterate. And so if we can collapse the runtime, if we can give them scaling that goes linearly regardless of the data volumes that they have, mm. then they can begin to improve their science in ways that they couldn't even imagine so far. So no compromises on your data volumes and your science allows you to iterate that much more frequently and science results come from, from that, that constant loop of iteration and improvement. Ahead, what about, you mentioned uh, you know, that today the vast majority of business decisions are made on intuition. Uh, changing that is going to take technology. Some of the things that you're talking about that you're doing at Pervasive, but it's also a cultural shift. Um, what world, can you kind of talk about that other side? That how, how, do you, how do you get people to change their behavior, to stop relying on their gut and start believing in the data? Um, you know, people have been, some people have been at their job 25 years doing it the same way, making decisions right. the same way, uh, with intuition, with their gut, and it's not easy to just make a switch just because you now have a piece of technology that can help you. Um, Right. How, how do you address that? Well, th these, as, as you know, are the hardest problems. So sometimes technology is easier than culture Yep. Uh, in terms of implementation. I mean, take that movie again, Moneyball. That, he chose it out of desperation. You know, his budget's 40 million, the Yankees have 170 million. He can't compete, and he has to look someplace else. And so I think we're going to see innovation from startups. We're going to see innovation from companies coming in from the side. The innovator's dilemma is that famous example. Maybe mm -hmm. the large players don't necessarily adopt mm -hmm. the latest technologies as fast. Maybe it comes from left field. Uh, and, and so I think you'll see uh, younger companies and newer companies, certainly if you look at internet businesses, mm -hmm. they've adopted this from the very beginning. Right. You know, every kind of marketing and web marketing analytic process is essentially inviting more data in <laughs> and inviting better processes and models so that I can make better predictions about what display ad to show because mm -hmm. they can directly prove the monetization. But I, I'm, I'm a little less uh, uh, wary about a business adopting this. Business adopted BI in a big way. Mm -hmm. They like performance monitoring. They like dashboards. Most businesses are very motivated to make better decisions. And I think if you showed them concrete results, mm -hmm. uh, I think you're going to find uh, the, the culture. It takes time. 
and, and it won't work every place, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic about, uh, about this you know, important change uh, in bringing this advanced science of data mining into day-to-day -day business processes. I'm pretty optimistic. It's a multi-year process, mm -hmm. but I'm optimistic that, that we can do it. Mike Hoskins, uh, Pervasive Software, exciting times. Um, it's great to see a 30-year-old company innovating uh, through, you know, by spinning off you know, pieces of the organization, focusing people on the problems and solving them. So uh, thanks very much for coming on theCUBE. It was great to have you. My pleasure, thank you. Okay, we're going to take a quick break, and uh, please uh, take a look at this ad from 1010 Data, and we will be right back.